Okay, we're going to start this recording over. I'm not going to go through everything that I just went through with you, but we're talking about crystalline versus amorphous solids. We're going to talk about crystalline solids. Um, crystal structure is the total three-dimensional picture um, that the pieces, the individual pieces are arranged in. Those pieces don't have to be atoms. They can be ions or molecules. And this part I find mind-blowingly cool. Okay, 20 seconds. Good. Now, <laughs> let's talk about the crystal lattice. So if you imagine a big Cartesian coordinate system, so the, the Cartesian coordinate system that you've always used in math, um, imagine that on three dimensions, and imagine the world as graph paper. <laughs> so in essence, a grid. The places that you would par put the individual particles you can line up on that grid. And that grid can be at 90 degree angles, it can be at other angles. The idea of the unit cell, it's the repeating unit. So it's whatever little geometric shape um, forms the basis for the structure. Okay. So in something that's cubic, which we're going to talk about in a little bit, it would be a little cube. We have other ones, and then that's the basic shape, and those lock together and stack together to form a larger solid. That, so the unit cell is that small base unit. Um, it's the, the smallest repeating unit. So when we talk about crystalline solids, there are two different ways to classify them, and we're going to use both of them. So things can be classified according to how they're held together. In, in essence, they can be classified according to their chemical bonds, or they can be classified according to their shape, and we call that crystal system. Um, binding force is the first thing we're going to talk about, and there are four categories of binding force. So we have ionic crystals, covalent network crystals, metallic crystals, and covalent molecular crystals. Those are the four broad categories. And you don't have to write those down. They're already written for you. So when we talk about... Now, we're going to commonly see three of these. Three of them you will be able to find at the museum, and I want you to find at least two examples of each if you can. Um, ionic crystals, these are pretty commonly on display places. Um, and that's not calcium chloride, that's calcium fluoride. Um, they're just repeating units of positively and negatively charged particles, cations and anions. And usually these are either alkali metals or alkali earth metals, so group 1 or 2, mixed with something from group 17 or 18. So like a halogen... Um, we get a lot of halogens here. These things, and if you remember trying to melt salt, these things have crazy high melting points. For most of them, you cannot melt them at anything that you can generate in a room like this. Um, but they tend to be brittle. They do tend to be brittle. And I could smash this salt crystal and get it to split and fracture pretty easily. Um, they tend to be hard. They have really strong attractive forces because every single positive ion and every single negative ion is pulling them together. And so sodium chloride, this is halite or halite. Um, it's just salt. It's table salt. It's sodium chloride. But when we have a chunk of pure sodium chloride as a mineral, the mineral name for this is halite. Um, and you, if you look carefully on a bag of rock salt... Oh, there we go. There are the fracture lines. Nice clean fracture there. Um, if you look on a bag of rock salt, you may see it called halite crystals or water softener salt. Um, and you can see the, the nice straight lines on that. That's not a bad one. Let's see if I can snap it a little bit more. So sodium chloride is an example. Um, calcium fluoride is another example. And fluorite is some pretty stuff. We'll look at some examples of fluorite. We'll definitely see fluorites tomorrow. Okay, so crystalline solids, uh, or ionic crystals, we do tend to see a lot of, and you'll see a lot of them in the gem hall. The next class, you will also see a lot of. These are covalent network crystals. 
We talked about these really briefly when we did chemical bonding in Chapter 6. And um, every individual little lattice point, so basically where the lines cross on the imaginary grid, is a single atom. They are sharing electrons with everything around them. So do you remember the whole metallic sea of electrons bonding thing where you had, you know, delocalized electrons and you had all of these, you know, large conglomerations of things sharing electrons? That's basically what happens with a covalent network crystal. Um, these things end up functioning like one big molecule. Now, if you remember, intermolecular forces are very, very strong or intramolecular forces. Forces within a molecule are very strong. Um, they're actually stronger than the for often between the forces um, in an ionic compound. So when you have something that's functioning like one big molecule, these things have insanely high melting points, like higher than ionic compounds. Diamonds are a covalent network solid, a covalent network crystal. Um, some of these things are brittle, some are not. Diamonds are not brittle. So what is the chief use of diamonds in the world? I have jewelry and cutting things. What do you think? It's cutting things. It's not being sparkly. And it's, it's not just glass. Um, diamonds cut rocks, diamonds cut steel, diamonds cut tiles. Um, you know, industrial diamonds are a huge, huge industry. And you can, I mean, you can go down to the hardware store and buy a diamond-tipped drill bit or a diamond-tipped saw blade. These don't look like the pretty sparkly things that you're going to find in jewelry. Um, they're small. I mean, they're sparkly. Like it's, and it's mostly dust. It's tiny little pieces of diamond that have been um, bonded to a metal surface and when you use it to cut or drill, those diamonds are what are doing the cutting. So those are industrial diamonds. And um, it's a huge thing. So diamonds are just carbon, pure carbon. We, we show it as C subscript X to indicate that it's this big network, but we don't know how, we can't answer how many carbon atoms. Um, quartz is another one, it's a silicate mineral, it's silicone dioxide. Um, and all of those little SiO2s are sharing stuff. So um, these things are not typically very conductive. They're, they're better insulators than they are conductors, but they are incredibly high melting point. And you will see covalent network compounds there. How do you tell if something's a covalent network compound when you're looking at it? Um, those formulas are a giveaway when there's a little something subscript X it's a covalent network compound. <clears throat> if it's got a definitive chemical compound formula, it's not a covalent network crystal. Okay, so the other, um, the third form that we have are metallic crystals, and this is any metallic solid. So if you have a chunk of pure metal, it is a metallic crystal. This is similar to the covalent network bonding in that you've got Pro, you've got um, nuclei with a sea of electrons, and they're all sharing. So any solid metal exists in, in nature in the form of a metallic crystal. These are pretty easy to pick out. If it's a metallic, it's a metallic crystal. <laughs> so chunk of copper, that's a metallic crystal. Chunk of gold, metallic crystal. And they do have some of those in the mineral hall, so you'll get to see some of those. Okay, so those first three types you will see examples of. This last type, you will not see an example of um, covalent molecular crystals. So these are just covalently bound substances. These are what we called molecular substances when we did that ionic molecular lab. Do you remember what one of the molecular substances that you tried to melt and successfully melted was? Anybody ruin a perfectly good cup of coffee by stirring it in this morning? Sugar. Yeah. Sugar is a covalent molecular crystal. Not a whole lot of call for that in the Mineral Museum at the Carnegie. Um, it draws ants and it gets messy and stuff, so they don't put that in. These things tend to be a pretty diverse group, and a lot of it is based on whether the, other, the things that are bonded there have enough of an electronegativity difference 
to make them polar. If they are polar, they tend to not be real volatile. So, name me a polar covalent substance, polar molecular substance. You're bathing in it. That was an old ad, you wouldn't know what that is. Water. Water. So, if you have solid water, which is called what? Ice. That's a covalent molecular crystal. Not a whole lot of call for that in the museum. It's not all that exciting, honestly, to anybody else. Um, you know, other polar covalent molecular substances. Oh, let's see. <laughs> That's the one that, I, that comes to mind first. Um, in the nonpolar ones, things like isopropyl alcohol, rubbing alcohol, ethanol, gasoline, those are all nonpolar covalent substances. Can you make rubbing alcohol a solid? Sure. Put it under low enough temperature and high enough pressure, it'll turn into a solid. It, at that point, is a covalent molecular crystal. Most of these things, however, are not crystalline at room temperatures, at temperatures that are room temperature for us. So they tend to have low melting points. They're easily vaporized. Um, you know, they're pretty soft, good insulators. Not things that we're going to see in the museum mineral hall. These are not things that are going to be on display. So those are the four ways to classify them based on what forces hold them together. Now, if we talk about how they're shaped, this is the other way to classify them. And for every mineral you can name, like for this halite, for these chunks of halite, um, we can classify them both based on the forces that hold them together and based on their shape, and we will pass these around. And they're so pretty when they're freshly broken and they're clear. So pretty. Okay, so the second way to classify these things is crystal shape, and this sometimes gets called crystal system. And in the field guides that we'll be using tomorrow, it is called crystal system. So it's straight up geometry. If you loved geometry because it's all just rules and relationships and it's very tangible, you're going to like this. Um, it's all about the length of the sides, whether the sides are equal to one another, and what the angles between the sides are. Okay, And really it comes down to the angle between this little dot and the next couple little dots. So you have to always remember that you're, you're really looking at these little points on a crystal lattice. That's what you're looking at. Okay, It gets a little confusing with the angles, but we'll, we'll do our best. And it, you're going to have all those, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't panic about those. Okay, so the first one we're going to talk about is the easiest by far. It is cubic crystals. So in a cubic crystal, all the sides are equal, all the angles are equal, all the angles are 90. It's a cube. And if you look at, you know, this chunk of pyrite, that's fool's gold, or this chunk of fluorite, the calcium fluoride, or this chunk of fluorite, while the overall piece may not be a perfect cube, it tends to break along cubic lines. Okay? And I'm fairly certain that halite is cubic. I'd have to look it up. It's either cubic or maybe it's monoclinic. We'll look it up. We'll look it up. So these are, these are really easy. You take little points and you connect them on a straight-up Cartesian coordinate system, and nothing moves. Everything's nice and even. Pyrite, and I'll write those up there for you because I know you're looking for examples. Pyrite's an example. Whoops. Fluorite is another example. Okay, so pyrite and fluorite. Um, tetragonal, 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 I'm never quite sure how to say it. So two sides are equal, one side is not. So side A equals side B, but side C is different. So if you look at this, this would be one of your little lattice points. And that goes straight up and down. This is where I find it confusing. So the angles are all equal and they're all 90 again, same as with cubic. But you have to remember that you're looking at the internal angles. 
So the angle between this axis and that axis, between this axis and that axis, and between the, uh, this is so hard to draw, that axis and that axis, in a little three-dimensional lattice. But anyway, those angles can be internal. That's how this form, this weird sort of bipyramidal thing, is in fact tetragonal, even though it doesn't look like it, because we're talking about angles that exist inside the structure. So if you look at the, the little axes drawing through the center, imagining the structure as being centered on a point in the middle. So, um, bolite. Bolite is an example. Um, cassarite. And if you look at cassarite, C-A-S-S-E-R-I-T-E, -E, chemical formula, S-N-O-2, what would you call that? Yeah, good job. It's tin four oxide. So, and you know, you you will see things that have chemical formulas like this doozy, um, PB nine Ag three Cu eight Cl two one or Ci two one OH sixteen. What? You can't speak a name for that. There's no way with the systems that we know to name that. Somebody knows a name for it. It's not us. That's above above what we do here. Um, and these are compounds that have multiple metal, multiple metallic ions bonded to multiple anions. So anyway, okay, so those are some examples. Moving on, orthorhombic. I think orthorhombics are cool. So none of the sides are equal, not a one. But all the angles are equal, and all the angles are 90. So here we have barite, B-A-R-Y-T-E, chemical formula B-A-S-O-4. You can name that one. So if you have the compound barium sulfate, and you have a chunk of pure barium sulfate, it's going to form a mineral called barite. And again, I, I, I always find this confusing, but it's um, just the way it works. Remember that those angle relationships are on the internal axes. They're on the internal axes. So you've got that one. Let's see if I can draw this. You've got that one. Then there's our, our other axis. You have the angle between these two is a 90. And the angle between this one and that one is a 90. So there are the three 90 degree angles. I don't know if that helps. I, I find the, the internal angle stuff kind of confusing. Really, this is one where you can just kind of memorize it. Um, it's not one where you can you have to go for deep understanding. Okay. Um, after those, we get into the stuff that's fun to say. Trigonal or rhombohedral. I just like saying rhombohedral. Sounds like you're going to rhomba. Um, sides are equal, angles are equal, but they're not 90. So what this always looks like to me is somebody took a cubic mineral and they smushed it. They took a little cube. You could make one of these with little styrofoam balls and toothpicks. And they took a perfect cube and then they went and sort of smashed it down on the side. That's rhombohedral. Um, they form really pretty mineral shapes, and somehow the chemical formula for that got screwed up, but it's dolomite. Um, dolomite. And the chemical formula for dolomite is C-A-M-G Oh, I can't fit it there. Cut. C-A-M-G C-O-3 two times. So it's a calcium magnesium carbonate Calcium and magnesium are existing, in, and this is ionic, you know, are existing in this crystal lattice. It's not that we have calcium and magnesium bonded to one another. Of course, they're both cations, but they're both bonded to the carbonate, which is an anion. So, uh, and we'll see, and we'll definitely see some trigonal slash rhombohedrals in the museum. Okay. Next up, 
hexagonal. So the hexagonals are pretty. We have two sides that are equal and one side that is different, or axes really. And then two angles that are 90 and one angle that is distinctly different, it's 120. So we have a 90 between that upright and that first one there. And we have a 90 between them on this plane, but then we have 120 from, whoops, from there to there. It's hard to see. But anyway, it's, it's one where it's not just that the angle isn't 90, it is specifically 120. And what that gives you is this distinctive hexagonal or six-sided face. And barrel, B-E-R-Y-L, is one of the best-known hexagonal minerals. It's pretty. It's actually the birthstone for a couple of different months in the year. And I forget which ones. And there are different forms of barrel. Um, it has different common names. But the chemical formula, it's beryllium. Aluminum, silicone, and oxygen, so it's a silicate mineral. Um, when we look at the field guide, we'll, we'll look at it a little bit more. So those are the hexagonal minerals. Then we have monoclinic. So none of the sides are equal. Angle A is different. So you have two angles that are 90 and one that is not. Okay, And if you look at this, basically it means you have little cubes. So that's a 90. And there are one angle. Now looking at that. We have a 90 there. We have a not 90 there. Oh, we have a 90 there. Okay, so we do have two 90s. Two 90s and, a, and an oddball. Um, and orthoclase. Or, the orthoclase minerals, there's potassium orthoclase, and I can, I can never remember the other one. I hate earth science. Um, but the orthoclase minerals are monoclinic. And you'll see a couple other monoclinics um, in the gem hall. They're uh, not uncommon. So the last shape or system is triclinic. So none of the sides are equal. None of the angles are equal, and none of the angles are 90. They're all oddballs. And this always looks to me as though somebody took a tetragonal, so one of those sort of rectangular ones, and smashed it over. But they smashed it on two planes, so there are no 90-degree angles left anywhere. Okay. Um, calcanthite. Calcanthite? Calcanthite? Chalcanthite? is one of the prominent examples of a triclinic mineral. Um, pretty crystals, very pretty crystals. And it always sounds to me like somebody's talking about a campsite with a lisp. Calcanthite? Calcanthite? So that's, that's the last of those. And I'll, we'll have plenty of time. I'll just leave these up and you can flip back through them if you need to get anything else. That's really it for the crystalline shapes. It's not a lot of material. Um, I'm not going to give you the assignment sheets until tomorrow, so if you're here with the sub, you'll get it from the sub. If you're on the bus with me, you'll get it on the bus. Um, but we'll talk a little bit about it today, and I'll walk through the field guide with you and using that. That's it.